All right, welcome back everybody for a very special Grain to Glass video. Today, I am attempting something I have uh, actually done before, but uh, failed to document properly. Uh, and that is a decoction mashed beer. Now we're doing a traditional German Hefeweizen. And uh, if you're wondering, yes, traditionally they were decoction mashed way back in the day. Uh, decoction mashing is not a technique that's practiced very commonly now, mainly because we have uh, exceptionally modified malts available for us so we don't need to do this practice in order to extract more sugars out of them normally and also we have things like temperature control and and thermometers basically brewers back in the day figured out if they took some of that thick mash out and boiled it for a while and then added it back in that they could raise the temperature of their beer rather precisely well because boiling temperatures never go past boiling temperatures uh, it's a it's a steady constant value once you reach that value uh, so they were able to control their mashes that way, and uh, obviously also were able to extract more sugars out of their, their mashes in the process. Now, I'm doing this because I hate myself. Um, <laughs> now, why I would ever want to create three hours extra work for myself and uh, introduce a whole bunch of variables into the system that could possibly make the beer worse, uh, I don't really know why I want to do this outside of being a psychopath. I, well, honestly, it's just because i done it once before and even though it's a ton of work, it is pretty fun. Now, if you're watching this video and you're just like, come on, man, I just want to do a single infusion mash. This decoction crap is uh, not necessary. You're 100% right. Um, you can do this as a step mash if you want, but you're also going to be able to do it as a single infusion mash. If you do a simple 60 to 90 minute rest at 152 degrees, you'll get great results. Uh, the decoction portion of it will create melanoidins, uh, which are basically uh, browning compounds, the same stuff that you would uh, get if you seared a chicken on a cast iron pan. You would get those, that, that crispy brown meat is so rich and full of flavor. The same exact thing is gonna be happening to our grain when we boil it. Uh, so it's gonna create rich flavor compounds. If you're doing a single infusion mash, all you need to do is add something like 5% to 8% melanoidin malt. Uh, and it's a specialty malt that'll mimic those flavors and um, it'll work out pretty well for you. But in my case, I'm not gonna be doing that because this is just the traditional way of doing things. Um, and it's a bit of an experiment for fun. Now, full disclosure, uh, this is my second attempt on making this beer and this video. Uh, I got all the way through uh, my brew day last time and I uh, had my sister here helping me with the decoction because it is a pretty labor intensive process. Um, and it ended up uh, working really well until I realized when I tasted the wort later that it had scorched. We are going to have to dump the first round of this Hefeweiss in here because well, it tastes like an ashtray, and that's just not something that I can handle. Um, I cannot put away five gallons of this. I, uh, I'm pretty sure I know what happened and what went wrong with it, and we're going to go ahead and attempt to do this whole thing over again. We do a complete mulligan on this beer. So I'm sure it would have been a good beer, but it lived a short life, and uh, we will honor its memory by making it better the next time. So, I use a heat stick to heat my mash to various uh, steps, and it turns out that even with an ultra low wattage density heat stick, uh, like the one that I have, if you heat a high protein mash, like a wheat beer mash, uh, from around 100 degrees Fahrenheit to about 130 degrees Fahrenheit, anywhere in that temperature range for an extended period of time, proteins will accumulate on the element and they will scorch. Uh, I did not realize this until experience told me otherwise. So this is why we're going to do a redo. I got all the way through that. I made the video. I even fermented the beer all the way out to see if it would change anything, but nope, I had to dump it. So in this case, I'm just changing the mashing procedure so I can guarantee we don't get scorching from the heat stick. And um, I'm going to use boiling water infusions instead to get it up that first mash temperature. But other than that, we're doing a double decoction mash. And uh, here is the recipe. So I made a Hefeweizen uh, using a single infusion mash actually last year, um, and it turned out great. It was 50% uh, Munich malts and 50% wheat malt, which is kind of a non-traditional grain bill for it, but it did produce a lot more bready flavors. And I thought that was a pretty awesome uh, example of what you could do with the Hefeweizen. Um, however, this time we're gonna go for a standard traditional malt bill, which is 50% Pilsner malt and 50% wheat malt. 
Um, so what I'm doing is six and a half pounds of each. And uh, I am gonna do one pound of rice hulls uh, to aid the laundering process, but I'll explain more about how I'm gonna use those once I get to the mashing part. For hops, it's just one bittering addition, and that's gonna be 1.7 ounces of Holler Tower mythyl fruit, uh, and 1.7 is whatever you need to get to 15 IBUs. Uh, that's about your maximum threshold for IBUs on a, uh, a wheat beer like this. So we're using the German Noble hops to get that bitterness in there. All right, so, and, and for yeast, I'm gonna be using the uh, Y Yeast 3068, the Stefan Weizen, uh, just one package of that. I'm gonna try slightly under pitching this so I can get some more yeast-based flavors out of it, um, since the yeast really is the primary component to this beer. Um, for a water profile, I'm gonna be doing something that's uh, kind of balanced toward the malty side of things. So we're doing 44 parts per million of calcium, 16 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, that's in my base water, so that's not gonna change. 51 parts per million of sulfate, 142 parts per million of chloride, and 53 parts per million of uh, uh, carbonate. Um, and everyone's base water is gonna be different, so you're gonna need to calculate your own additions if you wanna mimic this water profile. But in my case, I'm adding four grams of Epsom, three grams of calcium chloride, and one gram of chalk. Now I've also added half a Canada tablet to my mash water and that just gets rid of any natural chlorine compounds in the city water. Uh, not everybody needs to do that either. For the mash, this is the most interesting part of things. So this is going to be a very labor intensive process. Uh, the first step is going to be a ferulic acid rest which is at about 113 degrees Fahrenheit and that is going to create that really strong clovey phenolic -y flavor that uh, German Hefeweizens do so well. Um, now that's going to require us to dough in with 20 quarts of water at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to hold it at 113 degrees for 15 minutes. We're not going to recirculate like I usually do. We're not even going to use that heat stick. It's just going to be a simple rest. Then I'm going to infuse 12 quarts of boiling water and this is going to raise us up to our second rest temperature which is 145 degrees and that'll be held for 90 minutes. So we'll have a total uh, water to grain ratio of 32 quarts to 13 pounds of grain, which is pretty thin, but because it's a, it's a decoction mash, uh, that kind of requires a thinner mash than usual. Now, at this point, I'm going to take out some of the thick mash, and probably with about 45 minutes left to go in the step, I'm going to take the mash out. It's going to be uh, 9 quarts of thick mash and we're gonna bring that to a boil, we're gonna hold it at a boil for about 30 minutes, and we're gonna be constantly stirring this whole time so we don't scorch it. We'll add that back into the main mash, and that should raise the temperature up to our third step, which is 158 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, and that's the uh, alpha sacrification rest. Um, so the 145 degree step is the beta sacrification rest, which extracts out sugars from the grain, uh, the alpha sacrification rest promotes the uh, development of dextrins or unfermentable sugars that add sweetness but also body and mouthfeel to the beer. And we'll hold the alpha sac rest for 60 minutes. Then, with about 45 minutes left to go, again, I'm going to decoct eight and a half quarts of thick mash and we'll boil that again and hold it for 30 minutes, constantly stirring. And then we'll add that back into the main mash. Uh, to raise it to 168 Fahrenheit, which is the mash out. The mash out is important in this case because we are going to be using so much wheat malt. Uh, we're going to probably have a stuck mash, so it's important to do everything we can to make that lottering process easier to get as much work as we possibly can out of the mash. So during this step, I'm going to stir in a pound of rice hulls uh, to encourage the channeling in the wort so that we can get some sort of drainage out of this. Uh, last time I did this, it took three attempts of sparging to get it to where uh, I had enough liquid at the appropriate gravity to start the boil. Um, given enough time in sparge water, I think we're going to be alright, but uh, it is a pretty labor intensive process. And I'm going to try one other thing that's just traditional, um, but for me very experimental, and that is open fermentation. Hefeweizens are traditionally fermented in these vats that are... Uh, well, at least in Germany, uh, that are much wider than they are deep. And if you've ever seen a Hefeweizen yeast ferment, it's very aggressive, it's very explosive. There's a lot of Kreuzen that gets formed, a lot of CO2, positive pressure pushing upwards, 
so those beers don't actually get contaminated. Uh, so there's a Brewing TV episode out there where they tried open fermentation on a Hefeweizen and it had uh, some pretty amazing results. It will pretty much double the amount of esters and phenols that are created. Uh, so that's something that's a very important characteristic of this beer that I'm definitely going to try and do. So I have a bucket fermenter, um, so I'm going to use that and I'm going to put a little screen on top of it so we don't get anything that falls in the beer. But we're going to aggressively open ferment this for about three days. Uh, once the krausen starts to fall back in the beer, I'm going to transfer it over to a secondary fermenter where we will finish out the fermentation. Uh, but that's just because that protective layer of krausen will no longer be on uh, the beer. It doesn't make sense to open ferment because then it's vulnerable to infection. Um, but uh, if we transfer it over to second sealed fermenter, it should be fine. So I'm going to try that. We'll do it for about, that'll probably be about three days of open fermentation. And hopefully after that, we'll be ready to go. So now I've got 20 quarts of water in my main mash tun, and I'm boiling 12 quarts of water in a side vessel to add for that uh, infusion later. So we are ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and go in at 120 degrees with our grain bill. All right, so I did have to make some adjustments to the mash um, uh, to meet the right temperature. Uh, I, I think the water was actually a little hot when I doed in, uh, so it ended up actually staying at about 120, which would be fine, but I'm trying to target a very specific temperature here, so I added about uh, two quarts of cold water, and that brought it back down to the right temperature. So we're gonna let it sit here for about 15 minutes, and then we'll add the uh, boiling water to bring it up to the next infusion step. All right, so I just pulled a sample uh, of the wort from the mash. Um, it is in the middle of an acid rest, so I'm expecting this to be kind of acidic. I use pH strips to uh, check the pH and figure out if it's like in the ballpark or not. Um, and that's just because I can't really afford a high-end pH meter at the moment. And this will do. It's been fine for me in the past. So it looks like the pH is around 5 to 5.5. It's in that zone where we're going to be all right with the pH that we have in the mash. Okay, so our acid rest is complete. So now it's time to move towards the uh, Next step, which is 145 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and we're gonna do that by adding in the boiling water, but I'm gonna do that kind of gradually because I don't wanna overshoot the temperature by accident, so. So the temperature is now at 145 degrees, and uh, now that it's up to those sacrification rest temperatures and those uh, proteins are gonna be a little less prevalent in the mash, I'm gonna go ahead and start the recirculation process that I usually do. So uh, I'm gonna go set all that equipment up now, and uh, we'll begin the next step of uh, 145 Fahrenheit for 90 minutes. Okay, so I've let the mash uh, rest for about 45 minutes now. Um, so now it's time to start decocting. So uh, best way to do this is to use one of these uh, dipper type things. This is a one quart dipper, and you're gonna need another vessel uh, in which to take the grain out. Now it's important to make sure that we uh, get as much thick mash as possible out of the out of the mash itself and leave as much liquid behind as possible because the enzymes responsible for conversion are in the liquid, not on the grain. Um, however, we do need a little bit of liquid in there just so we don't actually burn the grain while we're heating it up. So I'm gonna start by taking the uh, recirculation stuff out and uh, then we'll start scooping grain into this pot here. And uh, as I said earlier, we're gonna do nine quarts of decocted mash. So all your thick mash is going to be down at the bottom. I get a nice deep scoop. Pour off some of that liquid. And uh, well, here's here's the before shot. I'm gonna put that in there. That's one quart.
there's two. And repeat until we get to nine. There should still be a decent amount of mash left in the main mash time here. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and try to draw off a little bit of this extra liquid that I got here. Um, because you want to have just kind of a, a little tiny layer of liquid on top of your grain. It's also going to make it easier to boil. So the consistency of it should be something like this, mostly grain, a little bit of liquid in there. So we're going to start boiling that now. And here's a mistake I made last time. You're going to want to not do this on full power. Uh, you're going to maybe do it on a medium high power because otherwise you might run the risk of scorching it. We don't want to do that. So while this is coming up to heat, I am going to actually start recirculation again, or at least attempt to, um, to try and keep the temperature consistent within the main pan. Okay, so now basically we're going to bring this up to uh, boiling over the course of hopefully about 15-20 minutes uh, and we're going to hold it, boil it for about 30 minutes after that. So as long as we maintain a consistent stir on this and scrape grain off the bottom of the pot, it's not going to scorch and otherwise cause bad burn flavors. So I'm just going to keep this up for the next 30 minutes or so and uh, just don't walk away from it. <laughs> Don't leave your decoction unattended. All right, so now it is time for us to start adding the decoction back into the main mash. Now, it's been boiling for about, you know, 15, 20 minutes, um, and it's sufficiently darkened. Um, so, as you can see, hopefully, this is what the grain looks like now. It's a lot darker, a lot more kind of dissolved and beat up. Um, and it actually smells amazing. Uh, it smells like kind of like a deep dark bread kind of smell right now. Um, a little bit of kind of chocolate brownie type notes in there. So anyway we're gonna add this back to the main mash gradually because we want to make sure that we don't overshoot our temperature although that's somewhat rare. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start pushing all this stuff back in now. So we got about 160 here, so it's actually a little bit on the higher side. So I'm gonna not recirculate this time. I'm actually just gonna let it sit, I think, before we pull our next decoction, which will be in about 15, 20 minutes. All right, so now it's time for our second decoction. So I'm only about 15 minutes into the alpha sac rest at this point. So uh, it just does take a while for the decoction volume to come up to a boil. So we're gonna go ahead and start pulling that now. So in this case, we're going to want about eight and a half quarts of decocted mash, but I think I'm just going to do nine. So just like with the first decoction, uh, we're going to heat this one up somewhat gradually and uh, hold it at boiling for about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll add it back into the mash. Just about finished up with the decoction now, so I think it's going to be time to start adding this all back in. Um, unlike last time where I added it all back in gradually, not to overshoot the temperature, this time we're headed for mash out, so anything above 168 degrees is fair game. So I'm just going to add it all back in at once and uh, then we'll 
do the mash out, let the grain bed settle, and then we'll be able to start watering, or at least attempting to. All right, so I decided that uh, I would start recirculating anyway. Um, because uh, I just want that grain bed to really be settled and figured out. So now I'm gonna add the one pound of rice hulls uh, to the mash because that's gonna help us create some channels within the mash uh, so that the wort can actually escape and we don't end up with a stuck mash. Uh, normally I would have actually combined this with a grain bill before we even started mashing, but with the, uh, with the decoction mash, it would have definitely destroyed the rice hulls uh, and rendered them useless. So. We're gonna make sure that these get pretty well distributed now, and then it'll also give it plenty of time to, uh, to settle out again. All right, so we've reached the mash out temperatures. Uh, so now I'm gonna start trying to collect wort. Um, because we were using wheat malt, like I said before, this is gonna be a very painful lottering process. Uh, it's probably gonna require maybe two sparges. Um, but anyway, I've got a bunch of sparge water getting uh, heated up right now on the side. So uh, we'll have hot sparge water more so than usual. We're gonna bring it up to about 170 degrees, which is what most people sparge at. Um, and that should hopefully get us uh, a little bit better um, efficiency today. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of all of the recirculation stuff. And uh, I'm gonna try my best to uh, Conserve as much liquid as possible and then we'll start collecting. Runnings are about four gallons, so we got about halfway there so far. <laughs> now I'm gonna start batch sparging, and uh, we're gonna see if we can get uh, a little more liquid out of this. Normally I will film the uh, transfer process, collection of the second runnings, the, uh, the filling of the boil kettle, etc. Um, but I had a minor, major, massive uh, problem in the process of this. The uh, collection kettle, which is that eight gallon kettle over there, uh, was about half full for my first runnings. And then I found, uh, I noticed rather, that the ball valve seal had completely ruptured at the bottom of it, and it was slowly leaking, well not slowly, it was leaking work pretty aggressively all over my counter, over the sink, the floor, everything, it was an absolute mess. So uh, I went into panic mode and collected as much as I could in random things, and then eventually we got up to eight gallons of work. Uh, it actually only took one sparge this time, so I'm actually pretty happy about that, but uh, there was an enormous mess that had to get uh, cleaned up in the process. But. Um, there really is never a successful brew day without something going massively wrong. I got a uh, refractometer for Christmas, so I'm gonna start using this for all of my pre-fermentation gravity samples. So I'll go ahead and uh, give this one a sample right now. So uh, our pre-boil gravity, it looks like it's about 11 bricks with, uh, with my refractometer, it has a correction factor of about 1.06, so that's about uh, 1.042, which is actually two points uh, lower than our expected uh, pre-boil original gravity, but that's actually not too bad, all things considered. So I'm gonna go ahead and drive on with a boil. All right, so we uh, just hit our boil, so now it's time to add our first and only hop addition, which is the 1.7 ounces of Hallertau Mittelfru, uh, and we're gonna put that in at 60 minutes, and uh, that's the only thing we're doing in the boil uh, until about 10 minutes from the end. Uh, okay, so now we've got about 10 minutes left in the boil, so 
I'm gonna use this time to uh, recirculate boiling wort through the pump and the chiller. And that's gonna help sanitize everything. Uh, and that's very important for uh, making sure that we have good beer at the end of the process. So the boiling temperatures will kill off any microbes and flush out any crap that's in the uh, chiller. And uh, we're gonna recirculate this for about 10 minutes and then uh, we'll go on to the cooling process after that. All right, so it's time to end the boil officially. So we're gonna go ahead and shut off all the heat sources. As usual, I like to start by uh, hot runoff going right into the uh, fermenter here to sanitize it. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and dial the uh, output temperature here down to about 65 degrees. So I'm gonna start by throttling the output here and throttling my pump and then changing the, uh, slowing down the amount of water that's coming out of my faucet here. So what we're doing is enabling the uh, work it's being chilled to sit inside of there a little bit longer than usual so that should cool it down a bit faster okay so we have a uh, output work temperature of about 65 degrees so that means that we're pretty much ready to pitch right now uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and start transferring the wort over into the fermenter and uh, then we'll go ahead and pitch our yeast now the fermentation of this beer is quite interesting uh, <laughs> so most accounts recommend that you don't actually aerate this beer heavily. Uh, so that way the yeast are slightly stressed, so that way they're able to uh, produce a lot more of those desirable flavors, the banana flavor, the clove flavor, uh, that we really associate with German Hefeweizens or wheat beers in general. So what I'm gonna do is not aerate, I'm gonna under pitch, I'm just using one packet, I haven't made a starter or anything, and um, and then the, the really interesting thing here is I'm going to open ferment this. So I have um, right here this sanitized uh, splatter guard that I normally would use for like cooking, a, you know, sauteing something. This is gonna sit over top of the fermenter and keep any sort of large debris, bugs, etc., from flying into it. Um, and that's gonna keep it pretty much, you know, sanitary. Um, but the rest of it is going to be open and exposed, and this is going to cause the, uh, the fermentation to be uh, giving off a lot more esters and phenols than normal, and it's also the traditional way that German brewers would do this. Uh, so hopefully in the process we end up with a very flavorful beer with just chock full of esters and phenols and just banana clovey flavor and also a lot of rich melanoidins from the malt and all of the decoction mashing that we did. Hopefully that all pays off. So. All right, so we'll go ahead and pitch the yeast right now. And last but uh, certainly not least here for the brew day, we've got about an original gravity of about 13.5 bricks. Um, so with my temperature, or with my uh, refractometer correction factor of 1.06, that uh, puts us in the neighborhood of about 1.051 uh, specific gravity for an original gravity. So that's about four points lower than uh, I had planned on, um, which is interesting because the coxie mashes are supposed to enhance your efficiency. Instead, this kind of d took away from it. All right, so about 24 hours after fermentation here, you get a pretty thick uh, Krausen here developing so uh, all the brown scuzzy stuff is uh, actually uh, byproducts from the uh, cooling process uh, trube and uh, hop resins and stuff like that so I'm actually gonna go ahead and take the sanitized spoon here and scoop it off try to get rid of it um, and that's gonna kind of help promote the generation of uh, healthy yeast and um, this is gonna help hopefully produce a better tasting beer at the end of the process. If you ever want to uh, harvest the yeast from fermentation, what I'm doing right now is scooping off the Krausen is a great way to easily get a bunch of yeast, uh, fresh, healthy yeast, in fact, uh, and that's just anything you're scooping off right now is gonna contain a large portion of yeast cells um, because it's all very healthy. And you put that in a mason jar and store it in your fridge for an indefinite period of time and uh, you'll be good to go. You can make a starter out of that in the future. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna just kind of spoon off some of the 
more dark looking kraus in here and uh also gonna kind of gently rile the beer up a little bit here promote some circulation i'm not scooping it hard because that would promote oxidation which is not something we necessarily want just kind of agitate it a little bit um get the yeast cells back in suspension and uh, as you see it actually replaces the foam on the surface of the beer quite fast uh, so yeast are all indeed very healthy and producing lots of co2 right now so that is good i'm going to do this for the next couple of days uh, every probably 12 hours so here's our final gravity sample uh, it's about 11 days into the fermentation and uh, looks like we're sitting at about 1010 so that puts us in a good region for ABV. It smells and tastes amazing. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and keg it tonight and hopefully it'll be ready to serve in a couple days. All right, so uh, the Hefeweizen was actually kegged yesterday. Uh, so it is only 12 days old, but these beers are awesome when they are fresh. It is not the best Hefeweizen that I've ever made. Um, and I think I'll talk more on that later. Everything went pretty well with the open fermentation. There were not any obvious contamination issues, uh, which is actually pretty awesome considering I just took the top off the fermenter completely. Um, so hopefully the uh, final result is gonna stay good for a while. Um, if this does end up like souring later due to a delayed infection, I will let you guys know. I'm not gonna hide any sort of brewing defects that I have, um, but for the moment it's fresh, it tastes pretty good, and I'm gonna talk about that. So let's just go ahead and get to that. So as usual, I like to do the Hefeweizens in the Weinstefan glass that I have here. Um, it's only appropriate considering we actually use their yeast. Um, so it's called Reinheitsgewatt. Uh, it is approximately 5.4% ABV and 15 IBUs and heavily carbonated, as a Hefeweizen should be. All right, so here we are with the uh, final result here. As you can see, it's a very nice, very pale gold, yellow. Actually, it's more on the, on the yellow side than the gold side. Uh, so the color of it is pretty great. It's a... Uh, very nice, pale, gold, yellow, uh, kind of trending more on the lighter side of yellow. Um, head retention is pretty good, not the best, actually. It does fade, but I did only keg it yesterday, so I feel like that's going to probably improve later on. Uh, it does keep a nice layer on the surface, though, during the entire course of uh, tasting. I think you'll see that. So uh, next up, we'll talk about aroma. I think I'm gonna do the thing. So the aroma is definitely heavy on the clove. Uh, not as much on the banana, uh, but the aroma is there. It's uh, it's definitely the most aromatic Hefeweizen that I've brewed. Um, and I definitely do attribute that to the open fermentation. I think the, uh, the rumors are true on that. It seems like... Uh, it seems like it's very heavy on the clove. <laughs> I definitely was hoping for a lot more banana in this, um, and I, I actually said that I would ferment it higher, and I did, but it didn't quite give me that uh, result, which is interesting. Um, you get a little bit of the maltiness in there too, a little bit of Pilsner uh, crackery kind of smell coming through. Um, and a little tiny bit of fruit, um, but not a banana. Kind of more of a peach, I think. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> we'll go in for the uh, the mouthfeel now. Mm. Oh, it's creamy. <laughs> this is a really nice mouthfeel. It's a uh, medium to full bodied, probably. Yeah, medium to full-bodied. I wouldn't say it's full-bodied because um, it still feels very refreshing, but it's got a nice creaminess that just coats your tongue and keeps you uh, tasting the flavor for a long period of time. Oh, it's just super creamy. Yeah, it's got a little bit of carbonation bite right now. Um, that'll go away in time, I think, but uh, it's it's traditionally a pretty heavily carbonated style. It's, it's exceptionally drinkable, very refreshing, um, and uh, just kind of got that nice little roundness that you look for in Hefeweizen's uh, mouthfeel. I think I nailed the mouthfeel in this. This is definitely uh, the best mouthfeel I've gotten out of Hefeweizen. Um, that might be attributed to the decoction mashing, perhaps. 
um, that is known to increase the mouthfeel in the body. Uh, so now I'm going to go ahead uh, and talk about flavor. So the flavor is actually rather different than I was expecting. Again, following the aroma, it's a lot more clovey than it is anything else, um, which is disappointing. I like a clovey Hefeweizen, but not as clovey as this one is. It can be a little overpowering. So next time I am not doing the ferulic acid rest. I think that just overdid it. That was too much clove. Um, it's a very deep flavor. It's complex. It's interesting. The, the flavor of this beer does change quite a bit. I mean, it starts out clovey, but you get a little bit of a nice tartness too, which is from the yeast. Um, it's got a little tiny fruity tartness that just kind of clips the cloviness a little bit. Um, and then it kind of goes into a more interesting definitely malt dominated back uh backbone um it's not what i was expecting <laughs> normally you expect kind of more of that kind of full rich wheat flavor from a german hefeweizen this is a little grainier um it's a little tannic uh <laughs> not overwhelmingly so and that might be kind of boosted by the cloviness of the flavor already but it has a little bit of that husky grainy taste that is an off flavor i know i did not sparge too hot i sparged at 170 175 um nothing's that would extract a ton of tannins during the sparge and i know that decoction mashing has a reputation for bringing tannins into the beer as well so that might be what it is it's not too much um it, it kind of is an interesting complex layer I'll say that much, um, but I don't know if it really works super well in this beer. Uh, I would rather see that in more of a Pilsner, I think. That would actually be really welcome in a Pilsner. Um, but this is kind of getting that, like, it's crisp. It's not, like, gross tannin flavor. Um, it's just a little too grainy for my tastes. And I think that might fade with time, perhaps, if we're lucky, uh, it'll fade with time and cold temperatures. But uh, for the moment, that is what is here, literally 12 days after fermentation. It is still a relatively young beer. Um, but other than that, all parts are pretty good. As far as tasting authentic, doesn't quite meet the mark for my standards. Um, it's not as great, I think, as a simple single infusion mash uh, Hefeweizen would have been with a little bit more malt complexity. Last time I brewed a Hefeweizen, I used a 50-50 mix of Munich and wheat malt, both from Germany, and it was good. It was really good. It was really rich, and it really had all of those flavors. Yeah, so I think what is best is probably doing a 25% Pilsner, 25% Munich, 50% wheat for your base, and then add a little bit of uh, Milanoidin malt to this, just to get a little character in there. A decoction mash, is not necessary for this style 100% you can do the same exact thing doing 152 degrees single infusion mash and get probably better results I, I don't think the decoction mash really did much to help this beer and I would probably not go through the effort again because this was really difficult it was a three hour mash and a really difficult water and uh and all that long 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 brew day uh, but at the same time it was actually a lot of fun i mean I, I i felt a lot more connected to the beer i had a lot more fun uh just kind of stirring that mash constantly being watching over it you know and making sure that it didn't scorch and just it felt like all of my energy got poured into the beer which was more fun for me um you don't need to do that <laughs> you really don't um, but the beer that came out of it was actually really pretty good for what I did. Um, not a competition winner, but you know, it's still pretty good. This was definitely a success though, compared to the first, uh, attempt that I made at decoction mashing the Hefeweizen, which was an absolute failure. Uh, so thankfully I redeemed myself and, uh, got a pretty good beer at the end of the process. So, um, it definitely doesn't get that same yeast character though that a bottle conditioned Hefeweizen does simply because it's keg. That yeast that is commonly at the bottom of the Hefeweizen bottle, normally you'd swirl that up and pour it in your beer and it gives you an extra dimension of yeast flavor. I don't get the chance to do that with a keg conditioned Hefeweizen, so that's kind of a downside as well. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a seven out of 10. Uh, so I'm docking points because of that husky grainy tannic flavor that's 
just a little bit in there, um, but enough to be noticeable that I don't really like. Uh, I'm docking points for being a little bit clovey and not enough banana, so it wasn't super balanced in terms of flavor. It was definitely a good idea to open ferment this. I would highly suggest doing that. It doesn't look like it got infected right now. Uh, everything tastes pretty normal, um, and there was nothing floating on the beer at all after I transferred it over into secondaries. So if you follow that regimen of just open fermenting for three or four days tops, rousing it every day, and then getting that Krausen off uh, each day, and then transfer over to secondary after that, uh, just for a couple days, I think you're gonna have a pretty good result. I think you'll like what comes out of that. I definitely notice a lot more of the yeast character coming through, and if you've ever brewed Hefeweizen in closed containers and, and just not gotten enough of that yeast, I think this might be the solution for you. I'm gonna do it in the future. Every time I brew a Hefeweizen, I think I'm gonna do that. I don't think I'm gonna decoction mash every Hefeweizen that I brew in the future, but, I think I will open ferment it, and uh, it's really not that hard to pull off. Just don't drop anything in it, and you'll be okay. So, uh, it was definitely a much more involved brew than usual, so hopefully this isn't too long of a video. I'll do my best to shorten things down uh, during post-production. But uh, if you like this type of thing, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps my YouTube channel become a lot more relevant to YouTube. And, uh, you know, if you want to watch more of this stuff, you want to watch me do normal brews, not just crazy things like this, uh, go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe. All of these things are awesome and mean a lot to me. So let me know in the comment section down below what you think about this brew day. Do you think the coction mashing is stupid and unnecessary, or do you think it's necessary and awesome? Um, either way, I'd be willing to talk with you about it all. So let me know if you've ever done anything crazy like this with a beer that's well out of the ordinary scale for a home brewer. I'd be very happy to talk with you about it, and if you want to make this recipe yourself, I am absolutely more than happy to talk with you about that. And on that note, in the description box down below, there is a complete recipe for this brew as of my system. You may have to adjust it for your system, um, but there's also a complete list of all of my equipment as of filming this video. There are links to Amazon where you can buy it for yourself if you wish to. Just be aware that if you do buy something using one of those links, I do earn a very small commission uh, at no additional cost to you, and it's a great way to support this channel. So typically I'll try to upload to YouTube roughly every one to two weeks, depending on how fast I brew or how fast I empty my kegs. But if you want more frequent updates, please feel free to follow me on Instagram. That's at the apartment brewer on Instagram. And I tend to post there a lot more frequently and in real time. So you can actually follow what I'm actually brewing uh, <laughs> before it gets to the YouTube channel. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer and I'm actually brewing a New England IPA right now as I'm filming this video. So I'm gonna get back to that. So thank you for watching everybody, I will catch you in the next one, and cheers. Okay, Karen, introduce yourself. No, I don't want to introduce myself. <laughs> you have to introduce me. No, you're putting this, I can't talk. You introduce me. You come over here and say who I am. Jim is just like, cheers, man. Yes. The sub, and then okay, so we have to introduce the this is my dog. sister. So, internet people of YouTube, uh, hey. this is my sister Karen. She is also an avid home brewer, and I do yes. believe she is better than I am. No. She has had some experience uh, working at a professional brewery, and uh, she knows quite a thing or two about uh, the science of brewing. So, it's quite fun to brew together for the first time. I know, and, this setup uh, is really cool. She likes it. So, this is fun. Yep. I make her stir. And Hi. here is the. Uh, this is Cadence. Cadence the brew dog. Cadence helps me out. Cadence loves to eat uh, the spent grains from the mash tub. Mix, 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 mix. My assistant here yes. is stirring hard. Stirring. Yeah, stir, stir, stir. Mm. Stirring, stir. Singing the stirring song. Well, you know, you have to drink homebrew while you're doing this. <laughs> so, I had a couple homebrews. Your friends are going to think I'm weird. I have friends. Huh. Do you want to get me some other IPA, please? I want to see if I can drain it out. Hmm. What? You did say clean. I spoke. You're my assistant brewer. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So that's my fault. <laughs> you guys are slaughtering pretty well. Oh, I'm... Yeah, no, it's not. Also, check this out. Yeah. Beer stash. Oh, you would. Hi. <laughs>
And, and, and we will come back with about 10 minutes left in the boil. To, um, just talk about the fermentation to be really quickly. So we're gonna go ahead and pitch our...